taking the time to chat with us today. Um, my Hi, first nice question you. is for you, Matthew. I was wondering if you could share with us um, how you went about finding your Matilda for this film. Well, it was a long search, um, extensive search during, we started during lockdown really, and um, <clears throat> and um, covered over a year of time. And there was a casting team led by a casting director and assistants and one of my assistants who went out on the road and met um, thousands of kids. And then also there were submissions sent in from people self tapes from home. Uh, over a long period of time. And, and in that pool of children, we were looking for Matilda's and all of Matilda's friends as well at the same time. And the really exciting thing was um, how talented the kids were that we met. And so even though there was a lot of tape to review, mm -hmm. it was always fun because they had to do a poem and a song and it was fun just watching everybody have a have a go at doing their different things. Um, and then we got a, a shorter list and a shorter list and a shorter list. And eventually I, um, I met some of the candidates. They came to London and did screen tests and, uh, Alicia was one of those. And, um, yeah, um, I first saw Alicia's self tape, um, quite near the end of the process, only a few weeks away from starting actually. So, um, she she sort of came into play as a as a strong contender right at the last minute. She was phenomenal, the perfect casting choice. I think so too. Mm. Great, Amanda. Yes, I'm Amanda from Guide for Geek Moms, and this one's for Ellen because I love me some TikTok, and that song what the uh, revolting the children has kind of become <laughs> a. a a dance sensation on TikTok from like Missy Elliott to Jojo Siwa doing TikToks of the dance. So I was wondering if you've seen it and what did you think about it and just tell us a little about it and and also how kind of how does it feel to you know be embraced by Gen Z like that? <sighs> um I have seen it, yeah. I mean I don't do social media, but my son does and uh so he was quite sort of taken i think when jojo siwa was sort of doing the the dance or whatever um and he actually told me about the missy elliott thing as well so i mean i think it's amazing really i think that the fact that dance actually can connect with that generation in that way I'd never ever thought about it like that. So for it to take, sort of gain that momentum, it, it, it's an incredible way, I guess, as a choreographer of, of watching the younger generation be inspired by dance. So I think for me, that was, that's the biggest thing I've taken away from it really. You know, just seeing all these people going, you know, all around the world doing it and doing it to different tracks. And yeah, it's, that's energizing that's amazing really yeah the sort of TikTok side of it I wasn't such I wasn't so familiar so it, I've sort of learned a whole new there's a whole world there really isn't there I'm yeah, not... yeah. <laughs> and let me tell you I've I've tried the dance and it was not easy <laughs> I applaud them all <laughs> Thank oh, I'm so tempted to ask you to just do a bit for us now <laughs> Um, do you know one of the exciting things? Because we, Ellen and I, are used to it being a stage show for years and years, and then we've made this adaptation to a film. And one of the big things that I didn't quite um, realize how big it was going to be, but it, I knew it was going to be an exciting thing, was finding a new audience, people who don't normally go to the theatre mm. and perhaps don't even know there was a stage show. And um, through this, uh, you know, through Netflix, it's going to be reaching. Um, millions of people, the audience for the story is going to be exponentially bigger than it's ever been before. And um, so that's quite an exciting, that was one of the several exciting things about changing it from one form into another. Mm. <clears throat> definitely, definitely. Thank you. I'm just going to jump in to see if you could expand on both of you on, on shooting that scene then for, for uh, what went into it. 
Matthew? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of planning went into all of the, the every moment of the film and uh, particularly the musical numbers because uh, and when there were lots of people involved. Um, <clears throat> they were very technical, the songs were to shoot. Um, so they needed a lot of planning. And in the months, um, more than a year leading up to shooting the film, the most of the film was made in a cartoon or scratch version using iPhones or and um, storyboard artists and animation and things beforehand so that we could work out what all the shots would be and um, technically what we would need on the day in terms of the set, costumes, props. So planning was the big thing. And once we'd conceived how we wanted the numbers to work and we'd drawn each other pictures and created storyboards, um, we then had a long rehearsal period and uh, in which Ellen um, took hundreds of children and um, trained them in the choreography for each number. And then they were filmed, those rehearsals were filmed very carefully by Ellen and her assistants and me and Tat Radcliffe, the cinematographer. So months and months, and months, and months of planning. And the one, the most famous bit you're talking about in Revolting Children, if you look at it carefully, there's no editing in it. It's one shot, uh, well, it's a series of long shots. And so um, the on the day, it was a question of making all of the elements, technical elements, <laughs> choreographic elements and performance elements plus camera work lighting and sound all work uh flawlessly together and i so and you just keep repeating it the shot until all of the elements were as good as they needed to be <clears throat> so <clears throat> over a period of time each of like one of those shots probably took about i would say <clears throat> about um between 100 and 200 hours of prep mm. something like that all in all helen i think yeah somewhere along that that sort of that amount of time i think it was just one of those things as matthew said you're kind of you're trying to take the idea and you know matthew and i discussed quite a lot about you know he wanted it to feel a certain way coming out of the school and but actually making dance keep that sort of energy, that sort of explosive energy, it feels quite hard to do that. So that's, at least for me, what took quite a lot of navigating, trying to keep the frame alive, really, and also trying to keep the children safe. Like, that was the sort of fine line. It's like how, you know, they're all working at their sort of maximum potential, really, to travel that travel that they're doing in itself is, is quite extraordinary at that speed. And then you've got the parkour children, you know, obviously flipping off of lockers and then just coming out of nowhere. So there were so many different elements alongside just the nature of the travel of the camera, you know, and for the children to feel safe and familiar with that, that they could then perform and sing. And, you know, it was like just constantly adding but we were fortunate we had you know we had a sort of rehearsal set built which I think maybe you've seen I think that's been on the social media so the children were really used to the space they 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 knew where the camera was going to be they knew where a sort of radiator cover might be they knew where a locker would be they knew all of that stuff so yeah Wonderful. And welcome. Kathy has joined us. So Kathy, why don't you jump in with your question? Hi, good morning. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. So the movie has been on loop in our house and my son, I think, knows all the songs now and he figured out all the different scenes and how it differentiates from the movie. But one of the things he asked me last night and actually um, Matthew just touched upon it and the questions for Ellen, how did you get all the children to work together? It was so beautifully done I want to know it's hard for me to wrangle one kid I couldn't imagine all those children so how did you do it and please share your wisdom um <laughs> well 
I guess it just, to be honest, it took a lot of scheduling. The scheduling for the film, I think, was probably the most extraordinary thing that I've done to date, really. You know, as we know, like working hours for kids, to get the best of them, you can only do a certain amount. They've got to school, they need to rest, they're traveling, it's a lot. So we sort of put them into, and with COVID, we had like designated groups. So certain groups could do revolting and Bruce maybe. And then another group would do the sort of external revolting and the flags in hammer. And then another group would do miracle. So they were kind of split really. But within that split, they got used to working with their groups. So that in itself made the number feel less daunting. I think they were they were sort of, if they were in the Bruce Collective, I think we called them, they were like 65 or 70 kids. So they would then sort of, you know, find their friends and their bonding. And then once you've done that, I guess it's just, you know, we were fortunate with time and COVID in a way that we were able to really plan a rehearsal schedule that allowed them to learn how to rehearse even. Like, you know, you you take for granted that they're just going to be quiet and listen. That's not realistic, as we know. Like, they're going to chat and they've got a friend over there and they're having a little thing. And, and also we were at points, we were in masks and visors. So that took a lot of navigating in that way. Um, but we've both worked with kids for quite a long time. So I think you kind of know, you get their respect, you tell them what you expect from them and what they can expect from you. And as long as you stick to that deal, I find that they, they respond very well. I don't know. Matthew? Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is, all of that's right. And the only thing I would add is that two things. Um, one is that if you give kids um, difficult stuff to do, <clears throat> when you call action, they're all concentrating on getting it right. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> so um, it's not something that they can mess around and get right. Um, it's too difficult for that. So there's a, there is more of a sense, an air of concentration, which is helped by the second point, which is although we had a long, long time to prepare for these things when it came to actually shooting it because of the kids hours and because of the, the all of the obligations of finishing the film on time we had very little time to shoot each moment mm. so sometimes we would say we'd be on the on the microphone and on the loudspeaker and say we've got time for four takes or something maximum of this so you guys need to be absolutely on it every time um, <clears throat> and so those two things the difficulty and the time pressure tended to make the takes go um mostly quite well the fact and the fact that have been prepared so um in such detail the bits in between a take when between between cut and action and the next action <laughs> I think that was a little bit harder to manage <laughs> those few moments of downtime were quite rowdy thank you awesome Robin so what character from the film can you both personally relate to? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. <clears throat> well, the, um, the right at the beginning of the film is a tiny little baby who says, has my daddy told you? <laughs> <laughs> who looks incredibly like I looked when I was a kid. So he and I have got some uh, affinity, solidarity there um the yeah i don't know i mean the serious answer is well a an, an answer is that as a director you you have to be able to work with every character and be interested in every character equally and imagine just for a moment as you're directing them what what the story is from their point of view and so there's no point not being able to connect you have to connect to everybody um, the terrible when they you know characters behaving terribly, characters who are brilliant. Um, so that's an important thing. Um, but the serious answer for me is that the reason I um, wanted to direct the stage version, like thirteen years ago, whenever I was sent the script, um, 
was because I, I didn't I, I really didn't enjoy school at all. I got bullied a lot and it was really tough for me because I was interested in what you would call soft things like um, the arts and music and, um, uh, and stuff like that. And it wasn't, you know, I had a couple of good teachers, you know, who were supportive of that, but mostly it was an environment where that was uh, a, a supported thing. And it, it was difficult being a, a young boy who was interested in those things, to be honest, when I was growing up. So that sort of sense of isolation and being and, and really um, being lost in my own imagination. That's what connected me to the um, story about Matilda. And I was very um, envious of her strength. I still am <laughs> mm -hmm. of her strength and her courage and her ability to stand up. But I think that's I put a lot of my personal feelings about school and being um, a kid who, who um, really loved their imagination into the stage version. And I was able to bring that to the film as well. But generally in life, I'm much more like Trunchbull. <laughs> 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 I said that last bit just for Ellen. <laughs> but I love the faces. <laughs> <laughs> that's the uh, that's the quote that's going to go viral. Yeah, that is. <laughs> um, I would say I don't know. It's a tricky one. I think um, I don't really. In terms of the main characters, maybe the librarian, Mister Spelps. You know, it's nice. I think it's amazing to lose yourself in stories and, you know, to listen to those stories. I think that's, I love to do that. I love listening to people. But to be honest, I'd love to be the kids. Like for me, you know, the sort of, that release of that expression, that freedom. I guess was something I never had as a child. You know, I never started dancing until I was 16. So for me to watch them be able to express through dance in that way, that's, you know, something that I find quite moving really. So yeah, I guess between the stories and the children's expression, it's sort of, I'm torn between those two things. Yeah. Not the trunch bowl, ever. <laughs> uh, we just have time for one last question. Amanda, why don't you, why don't you take that one? Okay. Um, so watching this version, I was kind of like, what, Matilda's parents seem a little more crueler than maybe on the stage version, I, I thought. And I, I thought it was maybe because, you know, we didn't get to see their softer side, like when they interacted with Matilda's brother on stage. So that just made me wonder, you know, what was the choice of not having him in this adaptation? And also, you know, what other things that maybe from the stage version didn't make it into the film that you were kind of like, you know, missing out on? Mm. Um, on in terms of the... Um... Are they um, softer or harsher um, as characters? Um, that's hard for me to. Um, I, well, I, I I can absolutely see how all the characters have a different intensity in the film, um, because not least because the camera gets closer. If you could put a camera close to some of the performances on that we've had on stage, you'd feel quite a lot of extra force from them. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting job for me to try to work out how hot to get at different times by in terms of closeness to the camera to different characters. Um, because of course, you've got the emotional depths in Matilda and Miss Honey, for example, particularly those two characters, uh, where put, getting the camera closer than it's than I've ever been able to get to those characters before on stage. That was a wonderful thing to be able to do. And also, as you you may remember, Trunchbull's face, we go right into her eyes and her mouth and her her face and things like that. And of course, can't do any of that. And that's for a different, obviously, that's for a different kind of emotional impact and um, to make her more fierce and formidable. Um, so there is an interesting calibration job to be done. The point about Michael, separate point really, um, early on in the process um, of developing the script, um, you know, I was, we were filling out the story in a more 
detailed way, in a more psychological way, if you like, than is needed on stage. The stage version is quite cartoony, and the film version, although heightened um, reality, um, and it's got supernatural things in it as well, it's nevertheless got more reality about it. And, and therefore, you have to ask more psychological questions and logistical questions. What kind of house would they live in? How many mm -hmm. classrooms in the school? Um, and all of those questions, sort of the answers that you choose for them add to the way you tell the story and what you're trying to get out of the story. Anyway, so the point is that I felt that Mr. and Mrs. Wormwood's very important, that they were very childish. It's interesting about the Wormwoods and Trunchbull, that they, they, those three characters behave like badly behaved children, whilst this tiny child in the centre of the story behaves like a brilliant adult. Um, and has got maturity. So I, f I felt like one of the re things that the Wormwoods are really unhappy about is having a child. That's quite a, that's a, a good, clear story to tell. And if you put Michael into it as well, it's a different thing that they're unhappy about with Matilda. Uh, and I wanted it to very much be about parents and children, adults and uh, not parents, children, adults and children throughout the story and whether adults are childish and children are, are mature and how the world is sort of upside down sometimes. Um, <clears throat> so it was easier to pure to tell a single sort of pure version of that story without having a, another child in the Wormers family, even though it does work on stage for different reasons very well to have him there. Um, generally speaking, you know, there were things that are in the stage show that were also filmed for this for the film, but um in terms of uh, the cuts that were made for the running time of the film, they didn't make it through. And there are lots of other things that weren't ever filmed, like, um, you know, like Michael uh, as a character and, and things we changed. Um, too many to go into now, but it's just the nature of the different form. I think it wasn't, some, some of those uh, cuts and changes were difficult to make emotionally because if we'd already filmed it and it was good, it's always hard to cut that stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the thing that we were all very aware, Dennis Kelly, the writer, and myself, we were all very aware that the stage show is so theatrical that there's no way you can put it on most of it on film. Um, it's doing its theatre job too well to be a film. And so we had we that was helpful because it wasn't like, oh, I wonder if we could slightly get that and keep hold of that in the film. Most of the time it was like, that'll never work. And so we have to start again with something completely different in order to try and make a film which is um, really cinematic in the way that we made a, a theatre piece that was really theatrical. That makes sense. Well, I loved it. And my daughter, who actually was in a local play uh, of Matilda, also loved it. So it has her approval as well. <laughs> That's nice. That's very good to know. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to keep Matthew and Ellen in this room, and I thank you all for joining us, and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.